I don't know. I'd like to call the March 18th meeting of the Wheaton Park District Board of Commissioners to order. Mike, please take the roll. Commissioner Vandershaft. Here. Commissioner Schobel. Here. Commissioner Me. Here. Commissioner Morrill. Here. Comm President Kelly. Here. Um, first item of business, community input. Has anybody signed up for community input? No, sir. No. Is there anybody here who wants to address the board? Okay. Uh, next item of business, the consent agenda. You got a oh, wait. I'm sorry. I missed the president. I guess we have a presentation, Mike. Linda? Yes. You're on. Okay. We have with us uh, Linda, the manager of the Leisure Center at Memorial Park. And our, for our presentation this month, we are uh, going to learn a bit about our program called Beyond Glee. I'm face that way. Good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Servatka. I'm a resident of Glen Ellen, and I am the director of this group called Beyond Gree. Uh, Beyond, <laughs> Beyond Gree. <laughs> and we'll try that again. I, I, this is why I direct and don't sing. I can't pronounce words. Uh, Beyond Glee. And we are, are in our third year of existence, and we're honored to be able to sing for you tonight uh, as part of the Wheaton Park District, which has been a fantastic uh, functioning group for us. Uh, Linda Dolan has been wonderful. So we're going to offer you this first song, which is the Illinois State Song. Taxes, so this right. is before then. 
Uh, we're going to do one more song. I tell you what, can we have some of the altos over here so we can just mix a little bit? Not all. Come on a little bit closer. And we're going to do a spiritual called Ain't That Good News. And I'm not getting my phone to talk, but I need to pitch. Start our every meeting like that. I think I think you got something there. Here's what we're doing. This one, twelve and thirteen. These two. Twelve, twelve and thirteen. Thank you. Okay, now we'll uh, move to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion? Move to approve the consent agenda items A, B, C, and D. Approval of disbursements totaling $777,187.19 for period beginning February 11, 2015, ending March 10, 2015. The February 18, 2015 regular meeting minutes. The February 28, 2015 finance subcommittee meeting minutes and the March 4, 2015 Buildings and Grounds Subcommittee <coughs> Minutes. Um, anybody have any questions or comments? <coughs> Mike, take the roll. Commissioner Vandersheff? Yes. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Commissioner uh, Morrill? Yes. Commissioner Mee? Yes. President Kelly? Yes. Um, unfinished business. These two items really are, are not anything other than follow-ups on previous board requests. Uh, if you recall, I was directed to make sure that these follow-up uh, reports were included on the agenda um, as unfinished business. So that's what we're doing today. So we received the proposed process for renaming the Central Athletic Facility. Yes, Ken. But number one. Uh, number one. No action, report on part-time staff. Yeah, I've got a question, though. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yep. So um, on, the, on the back here where it said that the increase was due to the police department recommending having two staff, 
Was there a reason why the police department came out to our facility, or were we just looking for general advice? They came out and gave us general advice. Okay. Okay. Morning, yeah. So you only have one person at the front desk. Yeah. Do we have that issue anywhere else in any of our other buildings? Not that early. But at other times, or how about late? How about in the evening? Where, there, where there's only... We have other staff in the building at that point in time. Okay. So there's always two people all the time now. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else on one? No, I was going to ask, just to make sure that there was a safety-related issue, as Kim had asked. But, yeah, um, using the... Community Center for workouts late. I can tell you that there's at least two people there till 10 p.m. You know when it closes. Okay. Um, so in item number two, we received a proposed process for renaming the Central Athletic Center, and it, there was a timeline included in that in, in the memo. And basically, at this meeting, they're looking for approval of the renaming process so they can develop a renaming campaign. The, does the board want to officially approve this? Is there discussion? Did anybody have any questions or comments on it? I'm okay with the process that they've laid out here. I think they're just looking for direction. Yeah. Anybody have any questions or comments on it? It's looked fine to me, too. I didn't uh, have any comments. I'd support moving forward with it. There was a comment made in the subcommittee minutes about corporate sponsorship. And how was that integrated in here? Because I didn't remember how that all mixed, how that all came together. To yeah. follow, it's a second stage. So is that going to be a separate policy? Yes, that yes, be it was. Okay. <laughs> yep. Is that? So basically at the, at the subcommittee level, I think we were talking about the facility would have a permanent name, but it might get a corporate name in addition to it down the road if there was a big corporate um, opportunity. Not a lot of the people in the subcommittee meeting were looking to do that unless it was a sizable amount of money. But, um, you know, we did say we would give it a permanent name okay. first, and then if there was a corporate opportunity, we would look at it. But. <clears throat> Not at the same time. So this is the permanent part of this. This is for the permanent name for the okay. Central Athletic Facility. Yes. Terry? Marge, are you taking the lead on this? Are you and Sarah or are you and just you and Sarah? Or Okay, thanks. Good. All right. So um, I don't think we need to vote on it. I think you, you have a majority of the board sitting here telling you that the process is okay and you should proceed that way. Um, and we'll take it from there. All right. Um, all right. So new business, uh, bid results and recommendations on the Ram football uniforms and equipment. I need a motion. John, I'm just going to make it short and sweet, and the Public Action Council will have to come and arrest us. So uh, move to uh, approve the 2015 football uniforms and athletic equipment bid results as recommended by staff. I'll second. Any questions or comments? Mary Beth, I do not have a comment this year. <laughs> okay. Um, this money might take the wrong place. Commissioner Vandersheff? Yes. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Commissioner Morrill? Yes. Commissioner Me? Yes. President Kelly? Yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to move a couple of items up if... If nobody has a problem with, I'd like to move items 12 and 13 up. I was going to do them first because we have uh, representatives from Rock River Energy Services. No, we have a representative from Our, the Illinois Gas Cooperative. Okay. Who Here. Is we, what we, what the, the two contemplated actions are to uh, seek approval from the board to terminate our current relationship for gas brokering uh, with Rock River Energy and the staff's recommendation. John, did you want a motion to move those up or what? No, I, does anybody, I don't think we need a motion. Does okay. anybody have a problem with me taking them no, out of order no, like that? No, okay, so we're going to move to new business, uh, item 11. 12 and 13. 12. Recommendations to terminate utility gas broker relationship with Rock River Energy Services. I need a motion. Can't we move, can't we combine 12 and 13 in one motion? Mike? Do you want to? Sure. Yeah. 
Okay. And I'm going to uh, move to terminate gas utility broker relationship with Rock River Energy Services and uh, authorize the Exec Director to execute intergovernmental cooperative agreement establishing the Wheaton Park District's membership with the Illinois Gas Cooperative slash IGC. Second. Anybody have any questions or comments? Kim? Uh, the email that came the other day where it was the gas cost recap 03 Who, Mike, did that come from you? Uh, yes, it was information provided uh, by IGC. Are you talking about the spreadsheet of, of rates? The comparison of where we were Mine at? wasn't that detailed. Um, I, I only have three columns here, so I don't know what... It Hang on. What, Ray, what there, is You know what, there was a subsequent there's set a of subsequent at the request of oh. President Kelly. Yeah. Okay. Um, when we got it the first time, it wasn't what the committee had been looking for, so we kind of spelled out what we were looking for on the 12-month comparison. Okay. That was the second email that went out. I think it was Tuesday, maybe Monday, no, Tuesday night. Okay. Monday or Tuesday. I have not seen that one. Okay. Okay. But it was basically a recap of our rates for a whole year versus what we would have had we been with the co-op. And it turned out the rates were basically the same. Okay. So then what would be the advantage of going with the co-op? That was going to be my question. Oh, okay. Can you, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. We have uh, both Colin Wilkie and, and Paul Kalis uh, who would be happy to explain the differences between what we've been doing and what they have proposed uh, with Illinois Gas Cooperative. If you could use the microphone, fellas, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, again, my name is uh, Paul Kalis from Vanguard Energy Services. Now, we are not the Illinois Gas Co-op. Colin Wilkie here is the chairman, current chairman of the Illinois Gas Co-op. That's been around since about 1987, approximately. Uh, there's about 50 member districts, school districts, park districts, library districts in the co-op. Uh, Vanguard Energy, we're in Naperville, we are the um, natural gas supplier and consultant for the co-op. So what uh, Mike and I have been talking about this for, for several months, what the co-op offers that maybe you're not getting from your current provider is um, very current and updated information on a regular basis. For instance, there's a board meeting. Uh, Colin will be um, running the board meeting tomorrow. They meet every month to discuss where the energy markets are, what's going on, um, what options are for pricing, what uh, weather patterns are, things like that. And um, uh, they, the board gives direction to us to either do nothing or maybe go out and lock in a piece of energy uh, maybe um, if there's a trigger price, right now we're in a, we're in a period of decreasing prices. Uh, maybe there's a trigger price out there that might be able to look attractive, and they'll give us an order to go out and book something, and then we'll do it when the market um, cooperates. It gives us that opportunity. So it's an ongoing process that happens every month or sometimes in periods of, um, of uh, dramatic price um, fluctuations, they might meet more more regularly over the phone, maybe every week or even every day if there's a hurricane brewing in the Gulf of Mexico, for instance. Um, all sorts of things like that. Um, so that's what we offer natural gas pricing that is very the, – the, the co-op generally is looking for price stability, so there's no surprises for budget certainty. And then the other thing is try to um, uh, look for opportunities in the market when prices are as low as possible. And like I said, this process goes on regularly, uh, not just maybe one day a year when you might get a bid for, a, for a, a gas price quote on one day of the year, April 1st or July 15th or whatever. It's an ongoing process. So those are the basic, I think, maybe differences in maybe what you've been going. I don't really know the differences, but that's the way the co-op works. Can I answer any other questions on that? Yeah. So, and I'm not certain who is going to answer this. Then 
obviously you have to be paid somehow. Is that cost baked into the cost per unit? Of right. Yeah, our corporate profit is paid by the IGC, and it is included in the price of the natural gas. So our charges on your invoice, for instance, every member of the co-op gets an invoice. Now, currently, we invoice every co-op member individually, but it didn't always wasn't always that way. For instance, there would be a, in years past, for instance, there would be one invoice sent to the co-op, say, for a million therms of gas. The co-op staff then would invoice every member district, collect the money and all that. Right now, we do all that as part of our um, agreement with the co-op. We invoice every co-op for their metered usage in that month. We collect the money. Um, and then, but our corporate profit is in the price of the gas commodity. No other fees. There are no management fees. There's no other um, monthly meter fees or no other fees on an invoice. If you look at an invoice, there's nothing on the invoice except the price of the natural gas commodity per therm. So what is that percentage? What's that number? Uh, I don't know what that is. It's not, I don't think it's a I don't know if it's a percentage. It might be a number per therm or something. I'm not sure what that cost. is. It's a fixed cost, yeah. Yes, it is. You got it? Colin, you know. Yeah, let me just add that, first of all, there's seven board members on the IGC. They all come from school districts. The IGC was originally started in 1986 for the purpose of going ahead and giving school districts certainty in their budgeting. Uh, just like you guys, we come out with our budget every year. I'm District 200 Operations Manager as well as being the chairman of the IGC. We wanted to have something that would go ahead and take us past the dark times and the good times and give us what's called a blended price. We normally buy out within two to three, up to four years in the future, and we look at long-term goals as far as purchasing. So we will go ahead and buy maybe 20% in 2017 right now because the price is that good. And then we go ahead and we can blend into that price. Give you an idea. Last year when we had the polar vortex and ICOR called eight days out of the blue as being critical days, a lot of uh, places were charging up to a dollar, dollar ten for their commodity when we were still blended in at 50 cents. So the advantage of long term buying the way we do it and managing the way we do it is that we go ahead and have an overall price that's been about 4 to 8% less since 2008. I don't know if any of you were on the board in 2008, but your gas prices back then were shocking, to say the least. Uh, nowadays, everybody's looking at maybe going back to cogens, like they had gotten rid of years back when, when the gas price was too high. Uh, the board serves at no cost. We, we do this out of our free time, and again, we do it for our district's advantage. And the great thing is with the 50 districts all together, we can buy larger quantities, which means that the cost is much less. Uh, if you'd like, we can get you that information as far as what the cost would be per unit, but that's normally how it, it's uh, addressed to all the school board uh, boards that we serve as well as the library boards, we've got some colleges, we've got uh, other uh, public entities that we serve, but uh, we, we've done well. Uh, I, I don't mean to, to sound rash, but we actually came into uh, direct competition with IASBO, which I am a member of IASBO too, so it's kind of weird. I'm kind of tackling myself every so often. But we've done better than they have, and their board is paid, so I think we're doing pretty well for what we're getting paid for. <laughs> Yes, sir. Well, you answered one of my questions. I figured you you were probably going out in, into the futures to, to lock in your rates. Correct. Uh, you said you, you're only extended out to 17? We're going into 18 right now. There's actually a contract coming up. Whether or not we're going to choose Vanguard, again, we don't necessarily, we're not tied into Vanguard all the time, but we are tied in through 2017. That's the end of their contract. So now to go into further 1819, if we entertain it, we will go ahead and look at different suppliers for us. I always say that ComEd is, is the, excuse me, NICOR is the train tracks. You can't get past NICOR. No matter what you do, they're going to charge you for the meter, they're going to charge you for the service and what's going through that meter. But you can pick out a good service like Vanguard that will drop your cost compared to what NICOR can. A lot of people will say, well, just do index. 
Uh, for a school district, that's almost impossible. You've got to have somebody almost like playing the market every day to see where those costs are. And any long-term uh, profit you might make from a very low index at one time, like we've had very calm temperatures in December, the index was, we couldn't beat the index. To be perfectly frank, we couldn't beat the index. But if you put all that entire year together, and I think you'll see that on your sheets, we can beat the index by blending the costs. Because unfortunately, just like the stock market, it does this. It goes up and down and up and down. And the highs and the lows, we kind of even that out and actually bring it down towards the low more than the highs. So that's the advantage of going with IGC. How do you determine what percentage you're going to lock in? Well, we have an actual purchasing committee, which is made up of three people, including myself. And we entertain uh, information from Vanguard. We've been with Vanguard for quite some time now. And it works out to where we've got our own uh, account rep, which is Scott Pellock. He's an amazing guy. He had worked for the larger commodities before, and he really knows his stuff. And we take a look at, again, every month we look at, you know, where is the market going? What's happening? Are oil rigs coming off? Believe it or not, oil prices and gas prices were very, very tightly tied together up until about three years ago. Now it's more of a free fall for gas prices, but not necessarily for natural gas. So we look at all the market trends, and then, you know, it's, I always like to say, is it need versus greed? How low will it go? And you don't want to go so low that you're, you're not going to catch that very, very bottom. You want to be a little bit more conservative. And when the rate looks good, and we've been doing this, I've been doing it now for almost 10 years, uh, you kind of know, you get that feeling where everything is going to be going. Thank you. So, so, I, so I just want to clarify something with Mike because I think I understand the way we're doing it versus now, and I want Mike to tell me if I'm incorrect or not. Currently, we have our own broker, which would be similar to working with Vanguard. But we're only buying gas for us. So Vanguard, our broker, makes recommendations to us, and Mike decides, yeah, we're going to buy this, we're going to buy that. But we're not gas experts when we're making these decisions. We're moving on the advice of our broker. If we join this group, now we're with a group of people that are working with the broker, and we have more experts out of our own group making the decision than just us taking the word of our broker. Now, it just so happens that last year, the difference in rates that we paid versus we compared our bills with the school district's bills, and we were right on. I think, wasn't the difference like $300? So if we had been with, you guys did $300 better over the course of the year than we did with our own broker. So our broker was giving us good advice. There just may be... If glass, gas prices start really fluctuating, we might be better off being part of a bigger group. The fact that the school district's been doing it for years is comforted staff a little bit. So we're really not changing how we're doing it. We're just moving from being on our own with a broker to being in a group with a broker. Is that, is that correct? Essentially, yes. I, I'm not comfortable with my background and expertise to be setting trigger points for natural gas purchases. I've never made a study of it, as the IGC has done. Um, I, Rita and I would sit with our broker and they'd say, hey, we think you ought to do these trigger points. And we'd say, okay, sounds good. Now, we have been getting good advice, but I like the idea of having in the added insulation of 50 larger school districts. I mean, CUSD 200 itself has 20 buildings, large buildings that they are pumping, you know, natural gas uh, to. Um, so I feel very strongly, especially based on my knowledge of, of what Colin has accomplished over there in the last eight years that I've been here, you know, working in the same environment, and also having purchased the old Wheaton Central building, paying their, their gas bills for a period of time when we were renting it, I know firsthand to what degree the care and attention is paid by the IGC. So I, I would prefer to have that backup as opposed to Rita and I pretending we know how to be gas brokers or respond to gas brokers information which is not our expertise and again the great thing is I've got uh, six other people and most of them are not operations managers like me they are actually business managers and they've got a lot of expertise to give to the board and uh, between everyone on the board and like I said Vanguard's been great we can pretty much look at expectations exceeding what you you guys have had before Mike and Rita, how much of your time has that taken up? 
not a whole heck of a lot because it's a short dialogue because we're not equipped uh, to deal with it. <laughs> um, it's probably going to take less now, I would imagine. Well, you wouldn't have any say, would you? It would just be automatic, correct? Well, correct. It, they'd be purchasing for us as part of the, the larger co-op, um, but we would have, certainly if the board or I or, or the IGC board became disenfranchised with how Vanguard was doing their job, I'm sure they would, they would, they would exercise some options in that regard. Sorry, Paul. But <laughs> and, and we um, would love and, to have Mike there at any time he wants to come by and bring donuts or drinks or whatever. <laughs> he can show up. <laughs> Uh, I think Rita's coming. <laughs> at, at, at any rate, this provides us an added level of, of uh, ongoing research. I mean, Rita and I will talk about gas prices once a year. They're talking about it once a month at the, at, at the, uh, uh, at the least frequent, right? Least frequent. Yeah. Usually if there's something that's popping, like we had the polar vortex last year, we met four times in that course of two months. Okay. I have a question about this. Who made this then? I apologize. That's the electricity grid, and that's oh, this not is electricity. this dialogue. I We're apologize. Doing electricity now. Okay, then. <laughs> Want it back? You're moving up. Oh, well, yeah, I should probably. Can I have yeah, that right back? Sure. Okay, Everybody thank wants. you. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question about this then. Uh, <laughs> does anybody have, anybody have any other questions? Or we now are all experts in how we buy our gas, so. Um, might take the roll. Commissioner Vandershaft? Yes. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Commissioner Morrill? Yes. Commissioner Mee? Yes. President Kelly. Yes. Thank you. All right. Let's go back to new business item two. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, new business item two. We have disposal ordinance 2015-01 for the Scut Electric Kill and 70 sets of steel lockers at Central Athletic Center. Move to approve. Second. Ordinance 2015-01. Zero one. Second. Any questions or comments? We can take the roll. Commissioner Vandershaft? Yes. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Commissioner Morrill? Yes. Commissioner Mee? Yes. President Kelly? Yes. Um, new business item three proposal result and recommendation fireworks display. Need a motion. Move to approve Melrose Pyrotechnics as the July 3rd fireworks vendor based on their proposal. Second. Anybody have any questions or comments? Kim? So do we have the complete information from Melrose Pyrotechnics? Because it seemed like an awful sparse document compared to what the other two vendors provided. Yes. Did we, we do have their, their name brands of the shells and the shots, with that said. Uh, but again, we're not comparing apples to apples uh, with a shell and a shot, manufacturers, size, um, so forth and so on. So with that, we have the shell count from Melrose, and we have a description of what those shells uh, will be made of and from. Uh, no, it's not provided in that 20-plus page document of the spinning tail blue blue. Well, yeah, because these people went into a lot of information. Like yeah. Mad Bomber went into a lot of detail. And, and our goal was to give you pretty much the shell count and the overall cost and the minutes, uh, not comparing the apples to the a apples to oranges in regards to the shell itself. Okay. They all were the same price, correct? Correct. And because we set the price. We set the price and we, spe okay. and we set the length of the show. Okay. And then they fill it in with their artistic expertise in regards to what kind of show they want to produce. And everyone agreed to meet the price and the length of time. Correct. Okay. Um, so I, I was surprised not to have as much detail. The other thing I have to say that I, that I did not like in Melrose's bid was this paragraph about their support of the park district financially and some of the things that they have done for our foundations. I don't like anything that kind of hints of pay to play. And I thought that was entirely inappropriate and should not have been in this document. Okay. Dan, I had a question. Yes. You know, it seems to me all this fireworks is all computer generated now, right? It's all launched that way, correct. So I realize we probably don't have time this year, but isn't there a way where if we specified we want an eighteen, you know, thousand dollar program and a twenty two minute show, we couldn't get a computer generated display of what we were buying so we could look at Three eighteen thousand dollars, or the staff could put together a committee 
look at three displays and yeah, we, pick we, the display they want? We could definitely do that. Uh, again, dealing with each vendor, uh, again, we'd get different responses from the vendors. But, but again, we could ask for that and seek that and ultimately it's because then see you if could, it's possible. Staff could, instead of just going with the guy we've used, used. every year, I mean, has staff gone and seen these other shows that are about the same length so they can say, yeah, I saw this guy's $18,000 show and... This is really better as a committee done. I, I don't think we've done it. Just a reference yet. check from the, so the villagers, townships that have. So I think launched. if we're a true competitive bid and we're going to set the price and you're going to tell us what our show is, there ought to be some way we can evaluate the show. And I'm not suggesting we do it here. I'm suggesting you do it we at do it. your level and come back and say, yeah, we saw these three $18,000 shows and this one's the best. You know? Yeah, we could definitely. If look there's any that. way to do that, I think that looks better than us. Going with the company we know when we've set the price and we've set the time and there's no other way for us to compare these these shelves. Products. Now, I'm not saying we do that this year. I'm just saying that we do that future. Terry. Dan, literally, we get more bang for the buck with Melrose. Is that about the size of it? Uh, again, they'll all tell you that, but I, we do believe so in regards to the 1600. Uh, well, more, I'm just looking at the shells. Yeah, with the shells itself, okay. uh, rather than those shots, which are more yeah. low ground effect cakes that blow off 100 yeah. fireworks with one fuse. And has this not been our vendor since we took over, Mike? Correct. That's what, okay. Anybody else? Mike, take the roll. Commissioner Vandershaft? No. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Commissioner Morrill? Yes. Commissioner Mee? Yes. Uh, President Kelly? Yes. Thank you. Um, new business item four, uh, portable restroom trailer at Arrowhead Golf Club. I need a motion. Move to approve the base bid from Comforts of Home in the amount of $25,445 in addition to the Alternate number one for the integrated ADA accessible restroom at initial an extra cost of twelve thousand eight hundred sixty nine dollars, and apparently the number two alternate for delivery to Arrowhead at no cost, in the total amount of thirty eight thousand three hundred fourteen dollars. Second. Questions or comments for the portable restroom trailer. Sorry about that. Questions or comments. Uh, you know, we've been moving towards this for the last two or three years, and you know, it's um, you know we've we've agreed to it in principle, and uh, certainly we've scaled down what initially was our desire to put in you know stationary washrooms. So I think you know there's uh, uh, no reason to go backward now. I think we need to move forward and see how it works. I personally disagree. I. I, I think this is a lot of money for a cheap solution to a problem, and I, I'd rather see us. I haven't been on the golf committee, so I haven't been involved in trying to figure out how to build a permanent washroom facility, but I'd much rather see us spend this kind of money on a non-trailer. Uh, even if we have to figure out where we're going to get the extra money or put it in the budget, but I think $70,000 for a trailer is, is not going to do what we want it to do at our facility. I think we need something better. Where was the 70000 John? Um, on Where's Rob's that? recap of all the costs that go into it. Oh, yeah. Right here. His well, recap is like 59000 but now we're adding the alternate. It gets us to like $72,000 for a trailer that's going to be ugly and rust. Well, I think that, you know, what we started off with, and I don't know that how you're going to reduce that cost that you're talking about, from, I think it was somewhere around eight hundred thousand dollars, somewhere between six and eight. I don't know how you're going to bring six to eight hundred thousand dollars down to, you know, this kind of a I'd number. I'd certainly like to try it with another engineer or something like that, but I just, I mean, I've seen these things. It's it's an awful lot of money for something that nobody's going to like, in my opinion. But we're, we're not offering any, them anything now other than some, you know. I, I know that. I, I think we need a solution to the yeah. problem. I just don't believe this is the solution. Well. In my opinion. Besides the permanent that I thought there were actual more problems around the water that were significant expenses for that 
eight hundred thousand dollars. But John, what if this is not the the option right now? Are you proposing I nothing? At, I don't know if there isn't a building we can build that uses a holding tank that could be pumped out just like this. But as a building that we build on the ground and then we buy some kind of a portable system to go with it. So we get rid of the septic field and we get rid of the line and we put in a tank. Maybe we put in an underground tank. We dig an underground tank. We fill it with water. I've put sprinkler systems for whole buildings in that have a buried underground tank and the water comes out of the tank. So I, I haven't been involved in the design from the beginning of the end. I've only seen the two designs. I can't believe there isn't something in the middle that will give us bathrooms that we would like that are, we, we probably will still have to pay to have them pumped out. It may be all the fixings that go into one of these trailers that we have to put into a building we built. And maybe it's just a little masonry structure with a roof, but it's permanent. Put some landscaping around it. I, I just, I don't feel we've explored enough other options for me to vote to spend seventy thousand dollars on a trailer, and that's just my opinion. Mark. Well, to be honest with you, John, I mean this came, from, I think, from Neil doing some of that homework and looking at things. And, and look, at my preference would be a permanent structure, but we got down to the point of you know, cost. I, so, I mean. The last permanent structure was outrageously expensive because of the utilities. We have not explored a permanent structure without utilities that's self-sustained with, you know, a company coming to pump a holding tank. And the, I don't even know if it exists. I just without, I haven't taken any time to research this on my own. And I, I just have a problem pulling the trigger on a trailer. But I'm just one guy, so... I don't want to delay way. this another couple of years. Rob, do, you know, maybe you want to weigh in here. Um, you were certainly part of that, you know, initial, um, you know, planning and research and so on and so forth that, you know, got us to a point where we said we can't afford this structure. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how much I can add. Um, this was... Uh, you know, another option. And, you know, as John's saying, is there something in the middle? Maybe. Um, my initial thought would be we need to look at the permitting side of things because this got us around some of those permitting issues with the county. And, uh, you know, I mean, we could certainly look that route, but it's going to take time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be more than this. It's going to be more than a year. Well, why would it take more than yeah, a year? I see, that has to be. More than a year. <laughs> I'm only what's basing lead, it on. What's the lead time on the trailer? Neil, do you recall? So, from when we pulled the trigger, we could have the trailer in place and another two weeks to hook it up at worst case. Then we could do the site work too. Or is the paving going to be done at the same time we do the other paving? Do we have a schedule for that yet? Do we have a schedule for that yet? Have we even bid that out yet? Pardon me? And as long as you're talking, Bruce, is this the solution the golf staff is? They think this is, as head professional, director of golf, this is what you think is best for our golf course? In a perfect world, this is. So if we do this, we won't be looking to do anything else. This is going to be it. This is going to be our solution. Well, what is the lifetime of this option? That would be my guess. Okay. Will we move it off-site in the wintertime and store it inside somewhere? <laughs> Inside the building, so it wouldn't be outside all winter. So, all right. Anybody have anything else? I take the roll. <clears throat> Commissioner Vandersheff. Yes. Commissioner Schobel. Yes. Commissioner Morrill. Yes. Commissioner Me. Yes. Uh, President Kelly. I'll abstain. Uh, 
new business item number five. Um, recommendation to fill a full-time position, Operations 2, Building Maintenance Technician. Move or, I'm sorry, Operations 3, Building Maintenance Technician. I'll move to approve. I have a second. Second. Questions or comments? Kim? So this is a redefinition of the role to tighten up what this job would do. And there's a comment here about the savings from some of our contracts with, you know, Border or Midwest Mechanical of about $58,000. So why would those contracts be eliminated now versus why couldn't they have been eliminated before? We, we didn't have the knowledgeable expertise of staff to be able to do that type of work. So all of this, we would not be retaining any of these contracts. All of them would go away. That's the intention. We find the right person who has the knowledge to be able to do those things. We should be able to get rid of that maintenance. And then everything that has been taken away from this position will be covered in-house, or are you going to see a need to have to hire someone else to, to do that? Well, we're looking at that right now, We and, and that was acknowledged in there that we're going to have to redistribute some of those tasks that were performed by that individual. We're going to look at other staff initially, but uh, Mike and I are also, you know, looking at the entire department to say, you know, okay, can we handle this in redistribution, or do we need to add some folks as well? Anybody else? Mike, take the roll. Commissioner Vandershaft? Yes. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Commissioner Morrill? Yes. Commissioner Mee? Yes. President Kelly? Yes. New business <coughs> item number six, recommendation to fill a vacant full-time position, catering and sales manager. Move, uh, to, move to approve. Yep. Move to approve. Second. Yep. That's second. Right. Second, just for clarification, we approved two additional positions, but and they've been filled, but one of the two original positions is left, so this is still to keep us at the four we approved at the last meeting. Correct. And is Jackie gone now? Yes. Okay. Revolving door. Anybody? Questions, comments? Mike, take the roll. Commissioner Vandershaft? Yes. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Commissioner Morrill? Yes. Commissioner Mee? Yes. President Kelly? Yes. Um, new business item number seven. Uh, approval to promote one part-time zoo educator to full-time zoo education manager at Cosley Zoo to meet operational needs. I have a motion. Move to approve. I second. I'll second it. Okay. Hey. Oh, now we got a motion in a second. Yeah, Ray. I like the way they put it. It's a respectful re recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure the other ones were all that respectful then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, before I go around on, on this one here, um, there were three of these that came up that are on this list tonight that I would have liked to see go back to the Finance Committee for more detailed discussion like we did with some of the other departments. And this, the zoo is looking for two positions and forget about what they are. Basically, the zoo is starting to make seventy to $80,000 profit and these two positions are gonna use up almost all of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd almost like to see that subcommittee meeting with Mike and his staff and where we talked about other alternatives and which position do you really need and is, can we do one to see how we do and have that discussion. But we didn't get that opportunity. We did. We took Larry's department and went through committee and then we took Arrowhead and we went through committee and all of a sudden now we've got like six of them that really didn't go through committee. Um, a couple of them I understand because they were vacancies, but... You know, I, I was almost thinking it'd be nice if we would have been able to take the zoo stuff through committee. Um, does anybody else feel that way, or are you guys all felt you got enough information to do it tonight? Yes, uh, Ray. These, these are two distinctly different areas. One is dealing with taking care of the animals, and one is dealing with the educational programs, rec what I would call recreational programs, 
one generates revenue where the other one maintains the health and well-being of the animals. I think they're totally different. And to try and look at them and decide whether one is more important than the other I, would be very difficult to do. Okay. Yeah. So I, I agree partly with, with what Ray had said that um, – Taking care of the animals, it is the almost table stakes at some level, although at no time was anything mentioned that our accreditation is at risk or anything like that. Um, but that, but the first one here around the educator role, I mean, this, do, this totally does eliminate any of their profit. And I had a question about the educator role that was hired recently at 28 hours a week, and I don't remember when we talked about that position. Let me clear, if I may clarify, are you, are you wondering why we didn't seek approval to fill a 28-hour position? So it says that it's a new hire. We, typic we were not directed to bring part-time hires to the board for approval. Okay, so... We would, be, we would have a meeting a week if we did that. Okay, so we need to be clear then, an additional 28 hours, which is not included in that 66000 and 89000 in revenue of the last two years... The additional money that that would cost, plus these two positions, and you're actually over your back in the red there. Um, I, th I think there probably does need to be more discussion around this educator role. I'd like to know what specific programs that would help generate revenue, what they are planning to do, hit the ground running with some of that information. Um, but I think we could vote on the zookeeper part of it tonight. I agree. Everybody else agree? How about the educator? We have a motion on the table for the educators. So, um, you, could, have, you could move to table to April if you wish and have, have a, the discussion at the subcommittee level and invite everybody um, who's interested in speaking with Sue and Dan and Andy about the position. Uh, as we have done in the past, there simply wasn't time. So, so, do, you want, month this month for so do you want the question called or does somebody want to make a motion to table? I'll move the table. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? All right. So then we are prepared, though, to do the talk about the zoo keeper position tonight. I think so. So I need a motion. Move to approve the hire of one new lead keeper, a salaried full time position. Second. Questions or comments? Mike, take the roll. Commissioner. Well, I have a clarification because I think there's a typo on page two. Full-time salaried staff. Is this full-time hourly staff in the second column on the second table? Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Nope. Mike, take the roll, please. Commissioner Vandershaft? Yes. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Morrill? Yes. Commissioner Mee? Yes. President Kelly? Yes. New business, item number nine, approval to promote one part-time marketing and events assistant to full-time marketing and events coordinator to meet the operational demands. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Questions or comments? Oh, yes. Kim. One of the things that I took away from here as I read through this was this comment that current event offerings and marketing efforts will remain as is. So it doesn't sound as if we would be putting anything at risk and feeling that we already have good marketing and we have a good program that remaining as is without this position, I think that would be fine. I don't know if I support adding this additional role. All right. Uh, two questions. Who does the marketing for the recreation department and the programs? And who is doing marketing specifically for Arrowhead Golf Course? Nobody? Can this person do that? I mean, so now they're going to pick up an area that's not being covered presently. It's being covered by other people. No, it's, I'm not, it's not being covered at all, I don't think. Other than the brochure, I don't think there's any marketing or recreation programs. Our Is athletics there? folks does a ton of marketing on their own time. 
but we do need more support from the marketing department for our recre all of our recreation programs, whether it be recreation and athletic and leisure center. Preschool programs, safety Preschool. city, it's, you know, it's kind of whatever it's in the brochure is what you get. And it's getting time that we need to market more and we need to do more email blasts, professional email blasts, just not what we can do on the computer. One of the things has been great with that. The, the talk about moving to digital and, and more online experience, that should be then we should be decreasing our print and it should be able to balance out. We should not be doing as much print as we're doing. 82% of our registrations came from online. So as far as trying to reset priorities, I think that needs to be looked at. And we, we are actually, that's one of our think projects that we're working on for 2016 is how we can reduce print. Um, we do have an overwhelming response from the community that they want to see everything in print, but we're working on how we can combine brochures or possibly eliminate one of the mailings so at least we can cut down the cost for 2016. Um, as far as the recreation marketing goes, currently, obviously, the marketing department assists as much as we can, um, but we are limited in what we can offer recreation. Um, last week in the weekly report, we put some initial numbers for some initial projects we had worked on with REC, um, and they are pretty outstanding on what we can do when we can devote that time to that department. So that's why we're seeking this position. Okay. Anybody else? Mike, take the room. Commissioner Vandersheff? No. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Commissioner Morrill? Yes. Commissioner Mee? Yes. President Kelly? Yes. Um, Before we make a motion on 10 and 11, did you, you want know, to? 10 and 11 are two that I would like to see um, back at committee, but if everybody else wants to take them on tonight, that's your call. So I either need a motion to table or I need a motion to. to table, 11, 10 and 10. 11. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you. So we'll see 7, 10, and 11 in a well, committee meeting. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, they'll go to a finance committee meeting. Now, does anybody want me to schedule that meeting in the evening so they can make it? I do. And does the finance committee have a problem if I move that to, like, Kim, like 6 o'clock at night? Uh, the, yeah, if, uh, I, if I have enough notice, I can make a 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock at night at uh, Mike's office. We can use a room yes. upstairs. Ray, can you do that? I can do, I can do most anything. All right. And that's you and... <laughs> Kim, Kim, the preferred location is the museum because of the train. Yes. Correct? Yeah, otherwise, you've got to move it back. So I, Yeah, because I okay. can walk from the train. Got it. Okay. So I, I'm okay with doing a 6 o'clock. Maybe we can put it after a buildings and grounds that, so that it... Just flip the order and push them back a little. You got it. All right. And uh, I'd like to see us do that within the next two weeks. So maybe if you want to send out some dates, and um, that way we can bring those recommendations to the board in April after we've had it. And you'll have staff there so we can talk about the various options like we did with all the other departments. Yes, thank you. So I have questions. Should I talk to Diane or Mary Beth ahead of time? Well, however, you would most uh, readily learn about the positions. If you'd like to simply send some questions, we'd be happy to have those staff answer them. If you prefer to use the phone, that's certainly your, your prerogative. No. All right. I don't think they were Mary Beth. Was that? Leisure it? Center is Mary Beth's department. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, we did 12. Uh, no, we're up to uh, 14 and 15. 14. 14. 14 and 15. Um, do you want to take those together? Yes. Same thing. Okay. Does somebody want to make a motion? Move to terminate electricity utility broker relationship with Northern Illinois Municipal Electricity Collaborative slash NIMEC and authorize the executive director to execute an energy procurement advisory agreement with Tradition Energy as a U.S. communities program <laughs> of which the Park District is a member. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Is this appropriate now? Yes, yes it, it is. is. Yeah, that's right. And, and I will apologize. I was not able to secure a representative uh, for oh. the meeting this evening. Okay, well, so the one thing that I just don't understand are the two columns of utility charges and why they would be different. 
if that's your standard meter charge, if that's your standard distribution, why would those numbers be different? The taxes. Oh, really? Like $400 in taxes? He had indicated that the taxes was one component as well as a 10% difference that he had been able to negotiate for his customers in some of the fixed charges. And again, for much of the same reason as Colin had explained before, he's combining. He's a nationwide outfit. He's working with a lot of different customers. So he's able to get some of those fixed rates down at a lower rate than the Wheaton Park District can get on their own. Okay, so we'd see a decrease in the actual charge for electricity plus our fixed costs coming from, these are ComEd charges, right? Yeah, well, if that's the one chosen. Well, no, for the... the constellation is who he, we have had. No, but isn't ComEd the one who owns the actual line? And don't we always have to pay them? You always have to pay an infrastructure charge, yeah. yes, Kim. And, and that's what this discount is on top of that as well, correct? In some of them. It's not in every category, but yes, they're able to get in some categories. And they have had clients that, are com ed, that have those ComEd charges in this area that they have been able to affect a discount of up to 10% as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Now, the way we are now... We sign a contract once a year, and we lock in a rate for the entire year. And we have the option of doing a one-year rate or a three-year, right? Typically, yes. One or three, and we've done one a couple of times. And that's why you see on that comparison our rates are the same. Um, my personal opinion was I'm fine with trying this, but I would like to – that we know what day we would buy our rate for next year. So I'd like staff to write down the rate that we would have got if we would have stayed where we were. And then every month – I'd like to see if we're doing better or worse, because we're basically agreeing to this based on the sales pitch we got. I've asked for data on, you know, what his rates were last year versus ours, and they really can't produce it because for distant, different customers, they're buying and selling at different times. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see how we do with him versus how we would have done right where we were. So I'd like to keep track of those if we're going to move to this. So that if we see we're paying more every month, we have the opportunity to get out. So it's a minimum of one year commitment we have to make. No, we can oh, we can fire these guys anytime we want, which is another you know a benefit of using it. We, if we track it in that regard, one of the if I may, one of the primary disappointments with the uh, with our current provider is that only single opportunity a year or every three years, if you lock in that way, to react to a bid. Um, and if you will look at this, the document that you were referencing, Kim, you'll see we jumped from 467 to 617. That is absolutely a direct result of the inflexibility of this bidding program. We, we should have been advised to buy power in October and September for the following year, and we would have been in probably in the low 50s as opposed to the low 60s. So this inflexibility has, has been something that Rita and I have been – uh, struggling with and chatting about for, uh, you know, a decent amount of time. When U.S. communities picked up electric brokerage and then hired tradition, they essentially won the national bid tradition did for these services. Um, we've, you know, our recommendation is simply that, that we're already a member. It's easy to do. We're not locking in. We, we are month to month with these people. We can get rid of them at any time. Um, and in the meantime, we're enjoying national pricing through U.S. communities, which we've been happy with before. If U.S. communities in their next uh, process for selecting a carrier or a broker, I should say, uh, decides to go not with tradition, we can keep them or we can go with the new one or we can go fishing somewhere else. So we have ultimate flexibility here and huge buying power, which is why I want to do it. Do we have anything else? Mike, take the roll. Commissioner Vandersheff? Yes. Commissioner Schobel? Yes. Commissioner Morrow? Yes. Commissioner Me? Yes. President Kelly? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, reports from staff. Mike, do you have anything? Take them in order. Uh, or what? I have nothing, uh, nothing to add. Okay. Then I'm just going to go to board member comment, and you can talk about reports or make a comment, whatever you want. Sorry, Daniel. Yeah. Okay. Can someone update me on what's going on with the roof over at the museum? I can. I read something in the minutes, but are we going with asphalt? Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, longer answer, we're working on how we uh, can respond 
Uh, we're awaiting some final data from the county who's on the construction end of the relationship or on the grant management end of the relationship. And um, as I, th I think you all know, the grant was suspended as, as were many, many, many others. Um, our unique situation is, is that we, are, we have already billed for 50%. Um, so again, short answer, yes, it seems like asphalt is the way to go without a grant. However, if we are able to somehow creatively uh, on the possibility that we get reimbursed for the money that we're out jointly together with the county in advance, remember this is a reimbursable program, um, there might be a possibility. So I don't want to say 100% yes, it's asphalt. I, I don't want to commit to anything. We're awaiting a little bit more detail from the contractor um, who has been, of course, notified like many others that you know, we need details on costs related to suspending this contract midstream because we have a contract. So to tie it up, we're not ready to answer the question yet. We should be very soon, and that will be in a buildings and grounds meeting. And if we hold that meeting when you can attend, you, you can hear it right out of the horse's mouth when we have our game plan. Okay. Who have we billed? Yes. Our, yeah, we are 25%. Of the of the without the grant, we're twenty five percent of the cost. The cost of the re roof reverts back to the IGA, where we pay twenty five percent of the okay. cost, and the county pays seventy five percent. But because we won the grant, we were putting that towards the cost of the roof, which was. So then, who would drive that decision? Would the county drive the decision because they're incurring? It's a, it's a joint decision. The county owns the asset, so I think they're and they want to get the job done. Um, you know, and obviously without the assistance of a historical preservation capital grant, it doesn't make economic sense to put an unfading red slate roof on it, which will also eliminate the structural improvements that are needed to carry that load, which is what kicked us to pass the election date, which, you know, we would have been done before the election and we might not be having this conversation. But regardless, the, all the facts are not in other than we're not getting a grant in fiscal year 15 for the okay. state which ends June 30th and, you know, fiscal year uh, uh, 16 begins July 1st. And, you know, I, I think the details are still being hatched as we speak on what's going to be appropriated for in that uh, state budget. Okay. So our board's going to have to decide how much we're willing to spend, in the, but the county board has a bigger decision before, so we're working together with them to see what's the best thing. To do. Aggressively. Okay. The problem we need to solve. And then I had one other question about the photo exhibit of Lincoln Marsh. Um, can I? Uh, I saw an email from Donna, who is not here, so I don't know who's in charge of the photo exhibit. Can I? Get, can I get a little bit of info about that? Like what it was? Uh, there's a reception soon, right? April twenty sixth, fifth. April twenty second. Oh, so close. Oh, and then what was the tenth? Then is that when we have to respond? Well, why don't we go back into our email and we'll okay. catch everybody up on what's going on with upcoming dates. Oh. I don't know, right? <laughs> it's, I'm okay, sorry. Thanks. At the college. It is at the, the initial reception is at the college. Then we're taking all of the paintings out on the road in the community and doing little mini receptions and, uh, and so forth. Uh, you know, and the, uh, the Friends of Lincoln Marsh will generate, uh, will be donated from Mr. Sheasley 50% of all sales. Um, and as an example of what is possible, um, one of his paintings was sold for, help me out, 300? 1500 1500 Wow. I could have, we could have got five paintings for my 300 Uh, at any rate, yeah, there, so this is, this guy's the real deal. He really loves Lincoln Marsh. Um, there's a wonderful, um, partnership that's been developed here. Another one with the college, which we're proud of. Uh, and, uh, I think a lot of people are going to really enjoy um, the uh, the results of his effort. He took a year-long sabbatical and painted Lincoln Marsh, is what he did. Yeah, so if you could let me know. Thank you. Mark, you have anything tonight? Ray? Well, we're going to these reports here. Yeah, you can go okay. through Go through all of them a little bit. Uh, early childhood uh, development, I was surprised to see that uh, our preschool programs are competing with 20 different preschool programs in the community. That, that surprised me. I'm, old, I'm older than you, Mark. <laughs> uh, and at some point in time, uh, if you could give me some further information in regards to the Wheaton Warrenville Early Childhood Collaboration, how we're partnering with them and working with them, I'd be interested in knowing that. 
the uh, Lincoln Marsh, um, what accounts or accounted for the decrease in the number of programs from 2013 to 2014? You don't have to answer it now. They decreased because the numbers were, were low? <laughs> yeah, number of participants. We also had a very large population that was not able to get the Bats and dragonflies. And I, and I like to see the uh, partnership we've got going with the Wheaton Library and uh, Carroll Stream Park District in order to try and get more participation. How about the Winfield Park District since they're so close? Oh, you need to. I mean, they're just down the block. I like the partnerships. Uh, appreciate that. The golf. <laughs> This, this obviously is why the golf course has marketing and recreation doesn't. This is a fantastic report. Uh, this, this is nicely done. This is extremely professional. I mean, this is top notch. I hope we put this out where everybody can, can see it. Uh, very nicely done. And then on the uh, recreation reports, um, uh, We uh, got uh, staff presented outreach programs to 125th graders from Highlands Elementary School in Naperville. And I think if we promote that through School District 200, maybe a little bit more, they might be embarrassed and want to get involved in uh, our environmental programs and that uh, more so than they are. And uh, Pleasant Hill still is working with us, and I, I got a kick out of the pennies for pigs. That's another one. If we promote that con concept, uh, it was a fun, a fun thing that I, I saw, read, and thought was kind of neat. Pennies for pigs. <laughs> That's all I have. Terry. Right. Yep. Uh, in order, the reports as they're listed on our agenda. Uh, Lincoln Marsh report. Thanks. Um, you know, the summary really helped. It's it's nice to see, you know, in writing, you know, what the marsh is all about. And I did like the looking forward pieces for each of the program areas that help, you know, to see where we're going and, and you know, what we've done. Um, the, um, you know, some of the other events that take place there, I think it's, I always think that Lincoln Marsh is, is underused, you know, and maybe it's not, but, you know, it's, it's, it may not be a revenue generator, but it's, it's a phenomenal experience out there. Um, like, uh, as Ray said, you know, as far as the Arrowhead uh, report, phenomenal. Um, Bruce, you can answer the question. Um, there's some data in here about golf outings. How did we compare number-wise golf outings in 14 to 13? They were very, very close. Say it again, please. Very, very close. Okay. Now, Justin, for you, it looks like we've got a few more trees. According to the report, about 83 trees left to be dealt with. You expect that over the last next couple of years, we'll have to take all those out? Yes. And uh, so is our plan to wait until this next fall to do whatever we have to do with some of them? Okay. Thanks. Uh, our... Uh, See that you know as far as the banquets, uh, banquet and restaurant, the revenues are still increasing year to year. That's pretty cool. Um, so we're still making money and seems to be ever increasing. So good work over there. Um, the early childhood report. Who's here to speak to that? Hi. Good job. Um, uh, I like the recommendations in the action plan for 2015. It always seems to me that. Tui Park and Safety City are underused. Am I wrong? Uh, they have been underused in the past. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we are programming at mostly, most of the mornings, and then um, now with the acquisition of the building, we will also be incorporating the Tui Park and Safety City into our classes. Um, so we could choose to do a traffic safety classes, which would be a completely online program for them there. Um, we also have a lot of students who come to our Wild Rose Beach Road and Tui Park and Safety City classes. Kind of program to 
Well, I know that, you know, you talked about, you know, trying to do some additional marketing for especially, well, particularly Safety City, and that's that's a fantastic place. And if we could get more attention and more, you know, field trips there, I think that's great. Um, finally, um, I was able to attend two of our recent uh, more major events, a casino night at the museum, uh, which was well attended, and then our wedding showcase at Arrowhead, um, the following day, or yes, the following day, f phenomenal. You all did a great job. I mean, it's once again, you know, it, w a lot of compliments for both of the events. So keep up the good work. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, forgot to mention the golf course is opening Friday. Thank you.